The following interview was conducted <clears throat> with Tom Bacher, the director of University Press, on Thursday, July 24, 2008, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. So the interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us where you were born and your parents and early years. Um, I was actually born in Nagoya, Japan. My father was in the Air Force after World War II. Uh, he had met my mother in Germany prior to that. They had moved to the States. Um, and then he was stationed in Japan. After uh, spending a very few years, I think two years in Japan, we moved to Duluth, Minnesota, um, which was another Air Force base at the time. And that's when he retired after 25 years in the Air Force. Um, then we moved to Ohio. And that's where I spent most of my years from, uh, I think it was six, till I graduated from college. Uh, Tell us a little bit about high school, what that was like, and then move uh, on to college. Yeah, I went to, went to, well, I went to a parochial grade school, one through eight, uh, called St. Bridget's in um, Parma, Ohio. And then I went on to uh, high school at Valley Forge High School in Parma Heights, Ohio. And I must say that I uh, learned a lot from one through eight, so high school years were pretty easy for me. Um, I, I was, uh, you know, I... I don't know if I enjoyed my high school years as much as I did my college years, but they were still uh, somewhat fun uh, doing some things in high school. Uh, and then I went on to a small liberal arts school called Hiram College. How did you happen to select that? And tell us a little bit about campus life and yeah, I and yeah, yeah. I selected it um, because I had a mentor in high school, a history teacher. I was in the advanced placement program in history. And he recommended that I go there. And uh, so I didn't know a whole bunch. My parents had never gone to college. So I was a, my sister had right before me. She was three and a half years older than I had. And uh, basically, I chose that college because of his recommendation. Went through a visit. I liked it a lot. I, was, I did a lot of things. I debated in college. I, did, I was a DJ at the radio station. I played golf. Um, I was a history and German major, um, and I really enjoyed it. I think it was a very a wonderful so experience. I lived on campus. There was no way to live off campus those days. I lived in some dorms, and I also was, uh, they created a house called the History House for History Majors that lasted a few years, um, and I was one of the first people to live in that house um, on campus, but I thought the community was very nice, and the how large atmosphere. Was the, tell, the, how large was the campus approximately? Yeah. Um, how many were your Their students were about a thousand students, I think. Uh -huh. uh, split up pretty evenly across four classes. Um, the town of Hiram is a very small town. They had, I think, uh, well, they did have a post office, but I know there was not a bar in town when I was there. And I don't think there was a grocery store either in town when I was there. I had to drive. Um, a few miles away to get some things like that. So it was very enclosed in a small campus. Yeah, okay. Then what, what year did you graduate? I graduated in 1978. Okay, uh, from and then there. tell us what was next. I um, went, uh, didn't yeah. know what I wanted to do, so I had an offer to go to Kent State University to uh, work in the uh, political science program. I have a master's in political science. I did, I was a TA. Um, at Kent State? At Kent State, yeah. And uh, so that lasted, I think, another two. So about 1980, um, I, I got a master's degree from Kent State. And then um, after that, I still didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I didn't want to go to school anymore um, and because I was sort of tired of going to school. Um, my sister at the time was living in New York City. Um, she was working for the Department of Commerce there. And I um, moved to New York City in the early... 80s, um, and I tried to get a job in New York City. It took a while. I first worked at the basement of Macy's department store on uh, in, on Herald Square. I was uh, I worked in the deli, um, so I know a lot about meats, cheeses, and fish uh, because of all the experience I had there, which I thought was fascinating. And I learned a whole bunch about customer service because of the people I work with and they had to deal with a lot of different types of 
folks who came to buy um, pate, which was not inexpensive, or um, uh, cuts of meat, which were not inexpensive. And it was a rather fascinating experience. I, I really enjoyed it, as a matter of fact. And a little bit after that, I finally got a job in a publishing company. It was I write, and I still like to write, and I thought that's what writers do, but I don't think that's what writers do. Writers write, and um, if you're going to work in publishing, you probably don't want to um, be, a, or, or it makes it more difficult to be a writer. But I um, got a job at a place called Plenum Publishing, which was a science publishing company on Spring Street in New York. Down the village. Um, yeah, the southern part of sort of Soho, right off the edge of Soho, 233 Spring Street. I remember the address still. Um, I don't think it's there anymore at that location. I think the company was sold. But um, that's I became a production editor, and that's how I got my start in publishing um, in New York. Uh, what, did, what did that entail? What sort of what job? What was that uh, job? Yeah, um, it was prior to computers being in place um, on the desktop, so we actually um, had to review materials that were typeset to make sure that uh, changes had been made, um, that uh, everything looked good, there were no missing words, or, or some of the material just didn't get it um, printed right. Uh, and, and if we had to make changes, we, got, we used X-Acto knives to cut and cut out um, words or letters, and, and we used X-Acto knives and uh, wax and things like that to paste words and letters back into the um, materials. So we were very good at doing that. Uh, we called ourselves word surgeons because of that. Uh, but it's a far cry from what happens today um, because of the nature of publishing and how computers have changed that uh, greatly, especially that part of the process. Right. Yeah. Did you do the, we were working with the galley proofs then? Yes, working with galleys and page proofs. Um, did both of those. Mm -hmm. um, worked there for several years and then I moved to another publishing company called Longman, um, which is, whose offices were uh, in Times Square in the same building as the Actors' Equity um, uh, facilities. Um, and I remember clearly about that building because there were a lot of auditions that would happen in that building up on the upper floors, and all the elevators in the building had mirrors in them so that the actors that were coming into audition could make sure they looked good before they went up there. Um, I may have seen some future stars, but I don't think I would have known about it at that point in time. So I worked, um, I worked there for several years. Um, How did you like living in New York? I, well, I was a... Um, Were you married at that time? No, oh. single in New York. Um, I think it's a good time to go to New York if you're going to go to New York uh, while you're young. Um, it's, it was a very um, a difficult process uh, economically. Um, costs were pretty high. I shared an apartment. Um, and But the nice thing was there was all a lot of the people I work with in the, the publishing companies were in the same boat. So we got together to do things. Um, and there's a lot of things you can do in New York that don't cost a lot of money once you figure out what's going on there. And uh, with the community of the friends, you know, we did a lot of things together, like played softball and um, did some other sporting activities, uh, went to events together, um, went out together. We, you tend to find the places that are sort of more local, um, off the, not off the beaten path, but just not in the um, areas where most tourists go to. And uh, so you can, you can live there. Uh, uh, it just uh, it was just it was fun I mean it was a very um, uh, educational part of my life I learned you know from growing up basically in the Midwest um, I learned a lot of other um, uh, lessons when I um, moved to New York uh, and I think that was great right. okay. so then that's your career path and then uh, we finished on a career path before I came to uh, yeah I um, worked at um I worked at Longman, then I, the next job I got was at Cambridge University Press, um, and that was in New York City. It used to be on 57th Street between Park and Madison, uh, their offices, um, and that was a rather a swanky area, still is, um, 
for a publishing company to have offices there. I think they had gotten at least you know a long time before that, and it was very nice. Um, and then after I worked at, but during the time I was there, they moved to Twenty Third, Twentieth Street between Fifth and Sixth um, in New York, and I. That was in a different area, but they moved their offices down there. I worked there for about six years. That's where I met my wife. Um, she was, was she working. working yeah, she was working there. And during that period of time, I got married, um, and we moved out to Connecticut, um, to Norwalk, Connecticut. I was still working at Cambridge for a period of that time, um, for a few years. And then I moved to uh, another publishing company, which was right next door in Westport, Connecticut, called Greenwood uh, Publishing. And uh, I worked there for several years, um, and I worked in different roles in different companies. Um, I was uh, at uh, Cambridge. I became sort of the database manager because computers had just started to come in, and I built their databases, their informational databases, their marketing databases. And then when I moved over to um, Greenwood, I was... Uh, director of systems and operations and we put in um, some networks and things like that and then I became I worked at a, a place in Armonk New York called Emmy Sharp after that that was my last job before coming to Purdue and I was a director of marketing and sales there um, and then uh, in 1997 in January of 1997 January 6th to be exact I started at um, Purdue University Press. How did you hear about the position? Was it advertised? Or? Yeah, the position was advertised, and um, I had, it had been sort of a goal. I wanted to become a director of a university press, and um, Purdue at the time was a rather small university press, um, and I remember clearly coming out on the interview, um, doing phone interview first. I don't remember the phone interview as much, but I do clearly remember coming out and interviewing with um, A.G. Rudd, who was the chair of the search committee, I think, um, when he was over in education and, and sort of walking the campus and making the rounds. I was unaccustomed working in the commercial sector to uh, coming and meeting with so many people in two days of interviews from uh, the editorial board to all kinds of different faculty members to some administrators at the dean of libraries, those sorts of things. And I was lucky enough to get the job. Okay, then we move on. So tell us what, as, uh, what the responsibilities and the mission as director of the press, and then um, some of the some of the acceptance routines and the peer review sure. here in your board. Yeah, the um, the press is mission is to primarily disseminate uh, scholarly information in a variety of fields, um, depending on what the focus of the press is. Uh, Purdue, we sort of switched uh, the editorial program to be um, one where we would do it in uh, the health area, especially Alzheimer's, some technologies areas. We had a little line of business materials that we've done. And we've also maintained uh, other areas that were here. When I first got here, we did a series in Central European Studies, a series in Romance Literatures, um, a series in Comparative Cultural Studies, and uh, we've also developed a journals program. Uh, That's journals nice program. That. Yeah, the series had they, one other thing on the series. Did they, did they have more than when you first came? Yeah, we expanded the series okay. um, by probably two or three fold um, by using some faculty members here and elsewhere to allow them to be series editors. One of the newer series we have is called Philosophy Communications, um, which is sort of a, a cross between communications and philosophy. Um, which was a series that started probably about two years ago, and we have four books in that series with a few more coming out uh, shortly. Um, basically, University Press um, makes sure um, by getting the materials reviewed by um, peers of those that write the books to make sure that they uh, add academic worth and content to the discussion. So if we have a history book in European studies, for example, we'll find some um, outside reviewers who are most likely faculty members at other institutions to review the materials and make sure that we're doing everything uh, correctly and that the materials and books are, are worthy of publication. After that, before we can publish any materials at the university press, 
we have a faculty board, an editorial board of nine faculty members, and we have to present the proposals to that board. This is not atypical of Purdue University Press, but happens in all the university presses. And the uh, faculty board has to approve the project before they finally get published. Um, and then at that point in time, if we get approval from them, we can contract with the authors and then put them in the manufacturing process. Okay. Um, so that's what we do. We do. When I first got here, we were probably doing six to ten books a year. We're doing between 25 and 30 books a year now without an increase in staff. Um, there's been some reasons that could be done with outsourcing and, and the like. Um, and we've set it up because we don't have um, an acquisitions editor, per se, at the Purdue University Press. That's a person that would go out and find projects. Um, at most university presses, there are acquisitions editors. So since we didn't have one, we decided that it was better to set up um, a whole um, a set of series where those editors could then go ahead and um, acquire materials for us. And that's in place, so we have a lot of uh, materials that are in process, that are always in process, and so we have the uh, necessary content to publish on any given year, um, those Does amount of books. The board has approval, but is it by consensus or majority? Or? It's majority. Okay. Most things are done by consensus, though I would say that it's there are a few projects where there will be some questions on the value of the book. Um, perhaps we may have to get another review from an outside source. Um, but for the most part, the board provides consensus on those, but it doesn't have to. It's just a simple majority if the book is being published or not. Right. Okay. What about budget and marketing? Budget. Well, I always think that the, uh, the press gets a budget. Um, that within from, the the, from the university, that's right. The university um, budgets um, and gives the press enough for the press's salaries and a small a supply and expense budget. Uh, the press then also sells, obviously, its content and has to um, pay for all the production, all the other necessary things, including the marketing out of that particular stream of revenue. And the uh, budget probably is... Yeah, as always, most people would say they need more money, and I think it's probably true. Probably more staff at the press would be helpful. We've done quite a bit with the small staff that we have, um, being kind of smart about outsourcing materials, um, deciding. Where's your to, production done? Um, we do. Is that outsourced? If we the the printing of the books right. okay. themselves is done outside of uh, the university. There's no facility here at the university that could do that. Um, it's done mostly at a place in Ohio. There are not many book printers in Indiana that would deal with sort of shorter run printing, which means we don't, you know, we do a thousand copies of a book, 300 copies of a book, mm -hmm. depending on what the book is. So we need a certain type of printer to make that feasible. Um, so we don't do that here. And most of our marketing is outsourced to we deal with a group that markets our books and we pray, pay them percentage on sales, 10% um, on net sales. Is the covers designed, do you have in-house or be uh, Yeah, we do. Most of, the is, most of the books um, covers are designed in-house. We not only use some of our staff members that do that, I've even designed book covers and the production manager designs books covers, but also we um, hire students um, every year there will be between two and five students. Some of them will be interns from a program at the university and we allow them to do a lot of book cover design depending on what their skill set is. So we uh, actually a lot of our covers are, are designed by students. Good. Right. Um, what about Notabelle? That's a, kind of an electric collection of your non-traditional classics. What, yeah, Notabelle is a, we have a few imprints um, which sort of distinguishes our books from one another. Nota Bell is a, 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 a collection of books that we have decided um, we'd like to target to the bookstore market. So they're, they're priced, their paperbacks priced under $15 for the most part. And so we've done um, books that um, perhaps would fit in that so that um, some of the books might be, I think one of the books in that series is The Letters of George Aid, possibly um, another book in that series was the, the Diary of an Engineer, 
in Central America in the early 1900s. There's sort of um, books sort of like that. I think uh, um, there was a John Perdue biography that was also in that series. We wanted to call it Bell Tower Books because of the Bell Tower at Purdue, but that was taken by another company, so that's why we changed it to No to Bell Books instead of Bell Tower Books. We have we have a, we have two other imprints that uh, I know of for sure. We have one imprint called Pup Books, P-U-P Books, which is an imprint that where we reprint um, books from the early 1900s adventures books for juveniles. We've done the Air, Airplane Boy books and Airplane Girl books, and we've done a series of Boy Hunter books, I think, in that series. And we also have a, a set of books called i Business Books, where we've done, um, where we partition those off too, where they're, they're books that we've done um, in the area of uh, call centers and those, those things in cooperation with some folks here, but we've also done some things outside of the normal scope of, uh, of that. So that imprints allow you to delineate in marketing what the particular book's traits are. I see. And look, just a couple comments on the future journals. One, of course, is that shelf art journal mm-hmm. that um, you might just make. A, uh, you've added journals, have you, since you've Yeah, added? we, um, I don't know if we did it uh, with a, a complete program plan in mind. Initially, we were approached um, by the folks that were doing shofar and ask if we might... Excuse me, for the research, that was in, in how it was uh, Purdue publication, am I correct? It, it comes research. out of the Jewish Studies, Studies yeah. program. Which at is a Purdue program. Pur- Purdue correct. program, that's correct. Okay. It was being published out of the University of Nebraska at the time that they came to us, the University of Nebraska decided that they didn't want to do some journals anymore. Um, so we um, contracted with the program here to do that journal. So we've done that journal now for, I'd say, four years or so. And as we got that journal, we found some other things that came along with it. We have um, a several journals now. I think eight or nine of them, four or so of them are, four or five are open access journals. We have um, the open access journals are first opinions, second reactions, which is a journal of reviews of K through 12 literature, not only initial reviews, but then uh, the editors go back and seek out an educator that used the book in the classroom and they tell us exactly what happened in that situation. We have something called CLC Web, which is Comparative Culture and Literature, Mm -hmm. which has been going on for 10 years, um, which is an open access journal that talks about comparative cultural studies, um, mostly, well, it's world, it's global, so that has worked for us. We also have a journal called um, Journal of Problem Solving, which is at the Department of Psychology at at Purdue, which talks about um, problem solving is based on the salesman's problem and how to go from um, point to point, which is done much easier than if you do it through a computer repetition. It takes a computer a long, long time to do it, and somehow the mind works better in doing those things, and that's the basis of that and the Interdisciplinary Journal of Problem-Based Learning, which is also a Purdue journal. And then we, we also have the Journal of Terrestrial Observations, um, which is an open access journal at this point in time. And we have a few other journals, too, um, that go along with that that aren't open access. Education and Culture, which is a journal of the John Dewey Society. Um, we have uh, called the Studies in America, uh, Jewish, Jewish Life in America, And we also have studies in Jewish American literature. And we just um, contracted this year to pick up um, Philip Roth studies. Um, So we have a a rather large collection of journals that just sort of happened over the last four or so years in certain areas. So we've been very lucky in those, that respect. Um, For the researchers who are going to be looking at it, um, could you just make a comment on what's open access? So just make Um, Open access is a... is sort of a, a philosophy that says that um, uh, there are two types of journals. Subscription model journals means that people pay for access um, to those journals, but it's closed, meaning that it's, it may be accessible um, to a library like the Purdue Library, but it's usually guarded by IP so that you have to have a, um, an IP address that's a Purdue IP address to get access to that. 
and the open access model is a little bit different. It means that uh, the materials, sometimes in open access, there's several varieties. One variety says you pay for the article before publication, the um, researcher does after acceptance. Or in some ways, it's basically uh, there's no costs, and the organization that's publishing bears the cost like the press. But it, what it does is that once the article is published, it's freely available to anyone in the world via web access. Um, so it's a way to distribute, distribute information more broadly um, than it is for subscription-based models. So there's both of those models sort of being in play right now, and open access is starting to gain a lot more credence because uh, universities understand that they pay for the researchers to do research and then they buy the research back from some um, subscription-based products. And so the idea is on the open access and might decrease the total cost of the system of, of research. Right. Uh, one of the things that you did was that meet the authors for the Purdue authors. Mm -hmm. Is that the first time that it had been done? Or? I, I, I don't know if it's the first time it's been done, but I think the program we did, because we had, um, had, we, had uh, we had five or so authors at a particular event that we've done at a local bookstore prior to uh, the holidays, usually. And I think that the number of authors um, and at that event was probably unusual um, to have, um, because usually book signings are sort of one author, but we did a lot of them. Yeah, that's very good. Okay. Uh, tell us about membership in the American Association of uh, University Presses. Um, the Purdue University Press is a member of the Association of American University Presses. We pay an annual fee to be a member. And the organization itself is uh, sort of a sponsorship organization for the university presses, um, and it's global, it's not just American. And uh, they basically they take the cause of university presses and try to let people know about them. If there's um, you know, financial questions, uh, operational questions, they can answer those for you. They try to promote university presses and the importance of university presses is sort of a primary mm -hmm. um, goal of that particular organization. I think there are about 120 members to that organization. There aren't a, a lot of university presses worldwide as opposed to how many universities there are, but there are uh, a number of them. Okay. Book fairs, you've gone to some of those. Make a couple of comments on those, sure. both um, national and international, right? Yeah, my favorite book fair to go to is the Frankfurt Book Fair, which is in Frankfurt, Germany every year um, at the beginning of October and it's not that it's a trip to Germany that makes it my favorite, it's just that it's the largest book fair in the world where it's everyone... It's a long, old one too. It's very old, yes. I think the Leipzig book fair which used to happen and then when there was the, uh, the Soviet Union and uh, East Germany it didn't happen as readily uh, before Leipzig is older than um, Frankfurt, mm -hmm. but Frankfurt is one of the oldest book fairs in the world. And, um, everyone comes to that book fair. It's, it's a book fair that's different because it's a business meeting where where publishers go and buy and sell rights to their books. So rights for translation, English edi editions in different countries, those sorts of things. I mean, for a university press, it makes some sense to, to go there as we've gone because we can sell rights and we can find out what's going on in the industry, which is very, very important. And without that... I don't think the press would have gotten as far along as it has. But there are, you have to understand, there's some major vendors there that are selling rights, like the companies that own their rights to Mickey Mouse, for example, sell their rights there. Um, so that it's a very high profile, high deal oriented. And the, the public doesn't get to come in until the, the book fair lasts, I think, five days, and they don't get to come in until the last two days. So it's all business to business meetings. Uh, I yeah. think that's the best one. I've also got a book exhibit of America, which is the American equivalent of that, which used to be a very important fair when there were a lot of independent booksellers in the United States. But over the last 10 or so years, the booksellers have diminished as an independence as big chains have come up. So it's not as important, uh, but people still go there. It's usually um, in three cities in the U.S. Um, it's in New York or it's in Chicago or it's in L.A. And it's okay, but it's still it's not as important a fair anymore as it used to be. Um, and those are sort of the primary two fairs that I go to. I go to some other exhibits that are more subject related, um, like a Communications Association of America or the Modern Language Association. Um, on ir ir irregular basis, as I go to those, depending on where they are, 
because we have some books in those areas and it's very important sort of to be on display just because right. you meet the end buyers at those things. Sure, that's right, yeah. Um, the um, Purdue Press, tell us about being on Good Morning America, how um, that came about, and well, also the New Yorker can make a comment on that. Yeah, we, um, we have a book uh, called Creating Moments of Joy. We've had the book in our collection since its fourth edition, so we started publishing it, I would say, eight years ago. It was done um, by a... Was it originally done here? Uh, yes, it's originally done here. Um, it is a book on providing information to uh, uh, people that deal with Alzheimer's patients um, on how to create small moments of joy, for example. If there's a photograph that uh, your father liked and uh, you can show that photograph and there can be some reminiscence about that. and. Of course, the person will forget about it, you know, in a few minutes or so. But it provides that feeling, good feeling for everyone involved with it for a small amount of time. Um, and the woman that um, her name is Jolene Brakey, who is the author of that book, um, has worked sort of diligently and provides seminars and things like that. And uh, earlier this month, uh, she was on Good Morning America talking about the book. And I think it's great for her and great for the press that that had happened. Uh, and it's a, just wonderful because the book is probably our biggest selling book that we've had. I don't know how many copies it sold over the years and iterations, but it continues to sell. And we saw probably two or three years ago, sort of a spike in sales, sort of reached a critical point where people started talking about the book, which is the way that things end up getting sold the most effective way. And those people started buying the book more and more and more and so it's now a perennial good seller for us and and I think her reputation and the book then got um, got the attention of uh, those producers at Good Morning America and they invited her on and she uh, was on it was rather uh, interesting to see her on and then we've done this book um, which is called New York's Poop Scoop Law uh, Dogs, the Dirt and Due Process, and it's a sort of a social history of how uh, New York um, passed a law to um, make dog owners clean up after their pets. It's not just dog owners, but primarily dog owners. And the social process of that, the legal process, and also the sort of um, cultural process of what sort of devices were created in order to make that easier. And um, we uh, we got into recently. It's been uh, uh, was written about in the New Yorker magazine. It'll be in the New York Times. It's going to be on. Uh, it's going to be in the New York Post. I'm sure it'll get play in um, some other places too because of that. So it's been a rather fascinating thing that those two things have sort of come about. Uh, a lot of hard work from all my staff to get it done. Good. How about, let's take a look at university presses in the 21st century and make a couple observations on that. Yeah, um, well, I think the Purdue University Press is in a sort of a good position um, because it's small um, staff-wise, too. A lot of university presses are heavy in their production department because they've been book producers all their lives. And so that uh, the book, I mean a physical book, has been what they've been doing. Um, much more of what's happening now is moving, of course, to the digital side of, um, of things, and that means there's a lot more e-books and a lot more content that's not really, um, I'm not saying the book's going to go away, but there's a lot more content in different areas um, that need to be addressed. And also the um, press, uh, Purdue and the libraries have a good cooperation of how that works, and I think that's great because a lot of the information that's at the university um, doesn't need to come out in book format, but it does need a process of being edited and formatted in a way that's retrievable over time. So I think presses, it's good to be small at this point in time, much more nimble, because you can take advantage of some of the opportunities that happened in those eras. And I think that what's what basically coming about now is that people, the end user is saying, I want the material in this format. It could be a book, it could be a digital um, um, e-book, it could be just a piece of the material, it could be a, a sort of a selection of materials. And I think the presses have to be able to provide that material. 
it's not the other way around. We don't push the content to them anymore um, in the way that we think is best for them. I think they pull it off the way they want to. Um, and that could be cause some economic problems as new models are being built to accommodate that. But there's always going to be the necessity to distribute research no matter where it is at a university. Um, and I think the cooperation of... exist for Right, that's right. That's what they're supposed to, especially a land-grant institute. Right. So, you know, there's the universities, I keep saying this, the universities that have university presses and that use them wisely um, to help them out in that process are far ahead of universities that don't. Um, and so that it's a very important thing. And I think it's got to be a collaborative process now. It's got to be between, you know, IT, the libraries, the press, faculty members, and, and eventually you'll build up this resource that's very important for the university and its prestige. All right. Um, how about, a, do you have a favorite Purdue tradition? And I also ask an outstanding event. You can take both of those if you wish. Outstanding. Well, I can tell you uh, the outstanding event for me is very easy to remember. Um, and it's sort of a fun, it's not funny, but it's sort of somewhat um, reminiscent for me because I came on board the same year Joe Tiller came on board to um, coach the football team. And I remember the first season um, uh, of that, uh, they played Toledo, um, a MAC team, and lost. And the second game was against Notre Dame at home. And this was the first football game I was going to watch Purdue play, and I thought, oh, gee whiz, they're going to get pounded. Well, it was one of the most exciting games. I went with my son, who was probably seven at the time, and it was the first big football game he saw, too, and it was just fascinating. And I remember, you know, the uh, how Purdue came back and won the game, um, and it was just like, and Purdue at that time, you know, the team hadn't been doing that well for several years so the fans I don't think this well it was Notre Dame game so I think the stadium was probably pretty full a lot of Notre Dame fans um, in that game but it was just the most remarkable um, comeback and the most exciting game I remember ever seeing at the university so that as an event I think that sort of was a nice start up to my time at Purdue so I thought that was just absolutely fascinating um you know, to see that happen. Uh, Purdue tradition, I think, uh, I actually like, I learned the Purdue um, sort of fight song, and I think that's probably my favorite um, because I did go to some sporting events and things like that, and I think that, you know, there's a lot of other traditions. We've done a book on uh, traditions at Purdue, um, and there's a lot of great history at Purdue that I think hadn't been collected for quite a long time, you know, sort of, uh, just sort of was put away places that people didn't know about and you know there's been a real resurgence in doing that and I think that uh, you know there's some fascinating things people don't really know have really happened you know uh, at the university and um, and I think it's important as a historical record to have those things and people do care about um, you know the sort of the traditions not that all of them are still in existence but uh, a lot of them are, and I'll never forget, you know, every time I'll hear, I guess it's probably true, but um, for other folks that when you've been at a university, whenever you hear the sort of the fight song at football games, even if you hear like sort of in the background at, uh, um, you know, when you're watching something on TV or something like that, you'll know the song and it'll be hard not to sing the words to it. <laughs> oh, Tom, any closing comments that you'd like to share? Oh, I just think that uh, as I, I, I remember part of the process here that it's, you know, there's a lot of things you can do at a, an institution or on a job, but it's, you know, way you can get it done is sort of through a learning process on the one hand, um, and also having the cooperation and help of other people, and sometimes you can inspire them and things like that, but you have to also do some of the work. You have to say what you're doing, you know, you have to make sure that you produce yourself, and I think that the, the cooperative nature of things is what really ends up with a very good product at the end and I think that's I've been blessed with having a lot of people here that I've been able to cooperate with and uh, yeah, been able fun. to do things with and it's been great. Good. Thank you Tom. This Thanks a lot. Thanks very much. You're, uh